the central fingertip skills of microsurgery are extremely simple and you will learn them quicker than you think and better than you think. But you cannot learn these skills and you cannot use them unless you first pay attention to the preconditions of microsurgical skill that I'm going to talk about now. Whenever I see people getting into trouble in microsurgery and whenever I get into trouble myself, it isn't because of any innate lack of skill at fingertip level, it's because of lack of preparatory thought, lack of preparatory skill. You can't do this fine work unless, first, you're in the right frame of mind. We're going to talk about that quite a lot. You can't do this work unless you are comfortable. You can't do this work unless you know how to use your hands in the right hand position for fine control and the avoidance of tremor. We'll talk about that. You can't do this work unless you know how to get the microscope into good shape, well adjusted to work for you. And lastly, you can't do this work unless you have good instruments and know how to keep those instruments in good shape. So, in this preparatory talk, we'll cover those five seemingly rather different areas, which all have this one thing in common, that they're absolutely essential preconditions for good microsurgical work. And listen up, I beg you, because they are more important than you now perhaps appreciate. Let's talk about psychology first. There are three useful things I can tell you about being in the right frame of mind. Two of them are, are useful straight away now, and one of them is something you need to keep in your mind for future use. I need to tell you about not overtaxing yourself. I need to tell you about how to avoid desperation, and I need to tell you about the importance of preparedness in the most general sense. The simplest thing about being in the right frame of mind is simply this, do not work for too long at a stretch. Especially in the lab, when you're doing that hardest thing of all, that's learning new things. If you work hard and attentively for an hour in the lab, you'll become tired, you should become tired, and the point when you become tired, you should take a break as a definite part of your learning program. If you go on working when you're tired and when you're getting a little fatigued and desperate, the only thing you're learning is I don't enjoy doing microsurgery. You don't in fact learn anything new or anything better. You just learn that negative bit which you can well do without. So at the end of an hour, take a scheduled break of five or even ten minutes and don't feel you're wasting your precious time. You're using it very, very well. The way you'll waste your time is if you stubbornly insist on working right on through the day, getting more and more fatigued and exasperated. That's a bad waste of time. So if one of us mentions to you that you're getting a little tired, however tactfully we say that, please take it as a definite order to stop and break. And by that I don't mean just lean back in your chair and take a couple of deep breaths. I do mean get up, get out of the room, disconnect your mind from whatever you've just been doing, and let your circuits recover and get reconnected before you go back to the work. Clinically, this is important too. Clinically, you can space out your breaks longer because once you're into clinical operating, you're generally into something that you know what you're doing, or you soon will be at that point. We very often work for two hours at a stretch before we take a break, and two hours is long enough to accomplish a simple procedure. If it's a long procedure, we think nothing of walking out of the OR, sitting down, relaxing, and switching off for five or ten minutes, and then coming back refreshed and much more efficient. The second important thing to tell you about psychology is a little bit about uh, developing a positive attitude toward difficulty. You'll get into difficulty learning this work, and sometimes you'll get into such difficulties that you'll get the paranoid feeling that the forces of evil are ranged against you on a personal and very deep level. And once that feeling gets a hold of you, you'll quickly go from 
difficulty to desperation and on to disaster and the distance between those three is a very close one in microsurgery. What you must learn to do, and I hope you'll use some of your time in the lab to learn this important habit, is when you get into difficulties, stop and think about what those difficulties actually are. They're very seldom great abstract mystical things. They're almost always perfectly finite, tangible, mechanical things which you can correct and which you should correct at a very early stage before they get on top of you. The sooner you can spot the fact that you're in difficulty, the sooner you can stop and think about that difficulty and correct it, the sooner you'll be back into good, efficient operating conditions. Let me give you an example. You may get to a point when you're in the middle of an anastomosis and you find that you're in a state of just cumulative desperation, that you're, you're holding your breath, uh, every muscle in your body is aching, and you're, uh, you're hovering on the brink of putting in a, a disastrous suture, which you, you know is going to be disastrous, and you, you know that the very next step, or the next step after that, it's going to be the final uh, mess that you make. Now, at that point, you still can retrieve the situation if you stop and think, now, how in the world did I get to this awful situation? You've got to do this in the lab because you've got to learn this habit of thought in the OR. Now, if you sit back and think, starting from the beginning, about what your difficulties actually are, you will find, for instance, uh, I saw this just the other day, somebody in this situation, that um, one of the legs of the table is a little short, and the table is wobbling, and has been all morning, and you could very well have corrected it when you first sat down to work. You'll find that your chair is an inch too high, and you've been stooping and giving yourself an uncomfortable body position. And again, you could have corrected that, but you didn't, so that needs to be corrected. You'll find that your work is arranged on the table in such a way that your elbows are hanging loose and you don't have basic stability of your hand position. And once again, if you'd thought about this ahead of time, you could have corrected it, but here it is. It's still part of your big difficulty that you're in. And then coming closer to the work on hand, you'll realize that in fact you didn't put the incision in quite the right place and your access has been poor all along and your hemostasis has been rather substandard so that you've got blood between you and the thing you're trying to work on. It doesn't take much blood to make your work invisible. Added to that, one of the eyepieces on your microscope is slightly out of focus and you haven't got a proper three-dimensional view. And I can't count these separate points, but perhaps seven different quite identifiable things have accumulated to make your job what we call impossible. And there isn't such a thing as impossibility, but there is definitely such a thing as a large number of uncorrected obstacles to success, which by your neglect of preparation, you can allow to get on top of you. Sit back and think about difficulty as soon as you can. Identify the difficulty and correct it, and you'll stay right on top of the job. Now lastly, and this is, like I say, for future reference, when you've done this many times, been into difficulty and thought your way out of it, you'll get such an efficient checklist in your mind of preparatory thoughts and actions that you will one day be able to walk right into a major microsurgical procedure, safe in the knowledge that everything is set up ahead of time to where nothing is really going to go wrong and nothing is going to distract you except the details of the job in hand. That should be your goal if you're going to do any significant amount of microsurgery. That's a long-term goal and you'll reach it by doing what I've advised you to do, that is to think very constructively about each difficulty that you meet. And think about your microsurgical setup, not just as what you have in front of you on the table or with regard to instruments, but think of your uh, microsurgical surroundings as including also the people around you, 
the room around you, the space and time and peace of mind available to you. These all are part of your surgical technique. And the next thing I want to talk about, you might think is also very abstract, and that's comfort. Now, comfort is not, in fact, an abstraction at all. It's not a luxury either. It's an essential in microsurgical work. Uh, comfort is neglected by surgeons in other fields because it's not strictly necessary for success in, in many other surgical fields. It's uh, considered, indeed, a little effete to uh, insist on being comfortable while you work. Well, in microsurgery, it's very different. It only takes a little discomfort to invade quite seriously that part of your mind which is supposed to be concentrating on the job you're doing. And added to that, microsurgery is special in that you're locked into one particular body position. And if that isn't a comfortable position, there's nothing you can do to change it. It gets worse and worse and worse, and you, you can't move out of that position. And very soon, a little discomfort becomes a very, very big one. So let's look at the business of being comfortable in quite a practical way. First, to define comfort, what it is. That's very simple. Comfort is a state of body position in which the minimum number of muscles are working in order to maintain that position. That's what comfort actually is. Now let's see how we achieve that. It starts at floor level. And there's some very important things to remember at floor level every time you sit down to work. You must sit in such a way, particularly with regard to your feet, so that your trunk has good three-point support, those three points being your seat and your two feet. Now, if you looked at this from above, you'd see that what we've got is a triangle here between the feet and the seat, and that's a very stable situation. I don't need to use any muscles to stop my back from rocking backwards and forwards or from side to side. It just maintains itself very comfortably. Now, if I just make a small change like this and put only one foot on the ground, then I've only got two points support for my trunk and I can wobble from side to side quite easily. And you'll find that you get quite sore muscles in your trunk after an hour or two, just trying to sit still in this position. Still worse, if you cross your legs up underneath you like this, then you've only got one point support, and it needs the constant, well-adjusted activity of a whole lot more front and back muscles to keep you upright and to keep you still, so you get even more tired. And worse again, let me just move up to the table here. If you try to work with your legs to the side, twisted right around like that, or if you try to work with your two legs spread-eagled out here to uh, come round an obstruction, you'll find yourself horribly uncomfortable and tired after a very short time indeed. So, at floor level, this is the position you start in. Now, in some kinds of surgery, that's easy to arrange. In hand surgery, it's not hard at all. You've got a nice table here and space beneath you and space too for your knees. No point putting your feet there if you can't get your knees there as well. In head and neck surgery, it's a little more difficult because you've got that rather thick table here and you've also got just down here the pedestal with all the knobs and levers and such like things. And we solve that problem in head and neck surgery by turning the patient round and putting the head on the foot end of the table. That way we have free space. When you're doing the kind of surgery that involves working on the middle part of the trunk, then you are really up against it because you have that enormous obstacle on the floor, which is the central pedestal of the operating table. And you really have to make some enormous adjustments to the patient's position on the table, slide him a long way down the table, put a huge leg extension on the table, even sometimes put a prop underneath that leg extension so the whole thing doesn't capsize, anything so that you can do this. Don't suffer. It isn't smart. It's simply foolish to suffer in terms of body position. Moving now from floor level, let's consider the table in terms of comfort. It's essential to have a very steady table, 
that doesn't move up and down or sideways when you work on it. It's important to have a table which is fairly shallow so that you don't have anything impeding your knees. And it's important to have a table that's wide enough that you can get yourself and your work and if necessary your assistant's arms on it and rest your forearms in this fashion. It's no good having a table and it's no good having a work position which dictates that you work like this with your elbows off the table. That's an absolute no-no. If you have your elbows hanging free, then a whole lot of muscles have to get to work to hold your elbows still. These muscles and these muscles. And if you work like that for any length of time, you'll not only have rather poor control of your hands, but you'll have a sore set of shoulders and a real stiff neck, and that's well worth avoiding. So just have your work set up here, well on the table. You don't need to have your electron on right on the table, but you do need to have the center of gravity of your forearm on the table, like so. Now the next thing which dictates the comfort of your position is the height of the microscope. Let's bring in this microscope. I don't have it switched on at the moment. That doesn't matter. Once the microscope has been brought into focus on the work you're going to do, the position of the eyepieces tells you where you've got to have your head. And if you don't have your head sitting at just the right height to look down those eyepieces, you're going to be mighty uncomfortable. Now this has a lot to do with the height of your stool. Let's see if I have the height of my stool right. I probably don't. If I sit here, and I bring myself to look down the microscope. If I keep my back straight and my neck straight, as I should, then my eyes are that much too high to see comfortably. To look down the microscope, I would have to slump down here and bend my neck in this way, and that's not comfortable, believe me. So I need to put my stool down. Now, let's see if that's any better. If I come up to the eyepieces now, I'm in fact just a little low, went half an inch too far. It doesn't sound as if half an inch is a really important adjustment, but it can be. You need to be very particular about this. That's just great. With my back straight and my neck straight, in neutral, relaxed positions, I can come right forward there and look straight down there. Good. Your nurses may think you're very picky in the operating room if you ask them to put your stool just half an inch up or half an inch down. But you should ask them to experience a, a state of microsurgical discomfort for a couple of hours, and then they'll realize they're not really fussing. One last thing about your stool. A microsurgical stool should have feet and not wheels. You don't want something that has a constant temptation to scoot away behind you. It should be very easily adjustable up and down, and if you really want the ultimate, it should be padded like this, but uh, that's not too important. You don't need arms, you don't need foot rests, and you don't need a back rest on a microsurgical stool, because those sources of comfort come to you simply from assuming a natural posture. If you need an arm rest or a back rest or a foot rest, there has to be something basically wrong with your body posture, which you ought to correct. So much for comfort. Don't neglect it. Don't think of it as a luxury. Don't think of it as an add-on. Think of it as a central part of your surgical technique. Something which you would no more start without than you would start without draping and prepping the patient. Get comfortable at the start of a procedure. Say to yourself, now is the time when I do those things which are going to make me comfortable. Don't wait till you're in the middle of the procedure before you say, oh, gee, I, I haven't got a place for my feet to be or, or uh, I've got a backache. That's too late. Your power of concentration is already messed up by that time. Do it ahead of time. It's so important. The next really important thing I have to talk about is hand position and the avoidance of tremor. If this is the first time you've done any microsurgical work, you'll be worrying about whether you have a tremor that's going to make your work difficult. Well, if you have a tremor, you're in very good company because I don't know anybody who doesn't have a tremor. A 
tremor, after all, is, is simply random muscular movement in your hand muscles and your forearm muscles. And we all have more or less of that. There isn't really such a thing as a steady hand in microsurgery. You hear about the microsurgeon's magical steady hand. But this is a myth. What there is is a series of very simple tricks and maneuvers for getting the most stable hand position. And this is what we'll talk about right now. Before showing you what is a good hand position, let me just cover some basic ideas uh, and preconceptions about tremor, things that make it better and things that make it worse. It used to be taught that uh, you mustn't smoke, you mustn't drink, and you mustn't indulge in various other enjoyments uh, if you wanted to be a microsurgeon. Well, uh, most of that isn't true, I'm glad to say. Uh, with regard to smoking, if you smoke, it'll impair your power of concentration somewhat for about 20 minutes after you've had a well-inhaled cigarette. So uh, I would advise against that. But it won't, in fact, give you a tremor. If you drink, uh, you would have to drink to excess to get the kind of tremor that would uh, seriously impair your microsurgical performance. Of course, if you come into work well clouded with a hangover, that'll impair your concentration. But uh, that's not what, what we're talking about. I'm talking about tremor right now. Coffee, this is an important point. If you are a habitual coffee drinker, the important thing is to know what your normal level of coffee consumption is and stick to that cup for cup and day by day. That way you'll keep your tremor at a minimum. If you exceed your normal intake of coffee, your tremor will get worse. If you drink very much less than your normal level of coffee intake, your tremor will get much worse. So if you're an addict, as I am, stick to your normal level of intake. With regard to those other forms of enjoyment, too, that uh, we're supposed to abstain from, if we're to be uh, perfect microsurgeons, I can tell you that, in fact, uh, that isn't important either. Uh, but maybe thinking about it is. And uh, I don't know just what you can do about that. Uh, that uh, you don't need to lead a monastic existence in order to be an effective microsurgeon. Having said that, and disposed of perhaps some uh, old wives' tales on the matter of tremor, there are two things which will make your tremor worse, your basal tremor. The first is strenuous manual exertion, and the second is getting annoyed. Now, if you do any heavy work which involves prolonged, vigorous use of your forearm muscles, like heavy lifting, like playing tennis, like sailboat riding, like working in the yard, or like using hand tools, that will increase the level of resting muscle tone in your forearm for even as much as 24 hours after you do it. So think of that. You obviously can't redesign your life and all your recreational pursuits around that fact, but you can sometimes avoid cutting down a particularly large tree or engaging in a log splitting contest the day before an important microsurgical procedure because it does have a very marked effect, believe me. With regard to irritation, you all know, I'm sure, because we all have our threshold of irritation, that once that threshold is passed, you'll get a tremor. Now, avoiding that takes us back to what I was already talking about in terms of having everything prepared and nicely set up so that you get no surprises and no irritations while you're carrying out your procedure. If you do get really annoyed about something or somebody, for goodness sake, stop, deal effectively with that source of annoyance, and give yourself 10 minutes to quieten down before you resume, because there's nothing more disastrous than continuing to work when something is right in the front of your mind annoying you. Having said that, I'd like to show you three hand positions. One of them good and two of them bad. And I'd like to show them to you under the microscope. We'll turn this monitor on here so that you can watch what I'm watching down the microscope. And having shown you the difference under the microscope, I'd like to then look at them from a distance and see what the differences really are. I'm going to just present you with the sight of my right-hand instrument 
and my left hand instrument trying to stay still. Now right now I'm using a very bad hand position and I'm trying to keep my hands still. I'm really trying, believe me, and the harder I try, the worse that random movement gets. This is the very stillest that I can keep in this bad hand position. If I try to pass a suture with this much random movement going on, it is entirely a matter of chance whether I pass it accurately or disastrously. And while I'm passing the needle, the amount of unwanted pain and trauma that's inflicted on the tissue is about 100 times that which is actually necessary for the mere passing of a needle. Added to that is the fact that the psychological trauma on the surgeon of trying to do work in this state of total uncontrol is very severe indeed. It just isn't worth trying to do microsurgery with this much unwanted movement going on. Well, that's a very bad hand position and we'll look at it from another angle in just a minute. Now let's look at another bad hand position, not quite so bad, but bad in a different way. Here, I've changed to where the big unwanted movements have stopped, but instead I've exchanged it for another evil, which is a very rapid high frequency tremor once again, I'm trying very hard to keep my hands quite still. Once again, the harder I try, the worse it seems to get. I can pass the needle now with slightly greater accuracy than before. But again, it's a worrying business. And again, just watch that tissue. I know it's only a piece of rubber, but it might be a living vessel. Just consider the amount of additional trauma that's being added to the necessary minimum in the passage of that shaky needle. It's almost like taking a pneumatic jackhammer to the tissues. So that again is a real bad position and we'll look at it in a moment. Now, here I'm using a good hand position and there's another difference too. I'm not even trying to keep my hands still. My hands are staying still simply because of the position that they're in. And I can maintain this position effortlessly just for as long as I please. I can make a little circling motion there deliberately, which is only a few thousandths of an inch in diameter. And it's the only movement that's going on. I can pass this needle, which I'll just do in slow motion here, in the absolute assurance that the only movement that'll happen is the movement which needs to happen and which I intend to happen. There's no trauma there except the absolute minimum which has to be. And there's the peace of mind of knowing that in, ha in this hand position, nothing unwanted is going to happen. Now, let's take a look at that hand and that position from a distance here and perhaps if you could come to where we can see my hand closer, I'll really be able to show you this in detail. While I'm showing you this, you might like to just take one of these instruments each and put it in your right hand so that you can, uh, to some extent, copy what I'm doing. There we go. In the first position, the really bad position that I showed you, I had my hand completely up in the air, unsupported like this. In that position, any movement that I made with my upper arm, with my neck and shoulders, with the lower part of my body, could all be transmitted straight through this fine system of levers right down to my fingertips. There's no effective support whatever. In the second hand position, I made this one small change. I put my wrist down on the table 
so that my forearm was at rest. And that got rid of the big movements, which arise mainly from the upper part of the body, but it didn't get rid of that little fine tremor, which began to look, in fact, even worse than it had been before. Now, that fine tremor arises from the fact that muscles are working, these muscles right here, and they're working to keep the hand up off the table. For as long as those muscles go on working, that's the extensor carpi radialis, that very fine tremor at the tip of the needle will continue. So I don't need to tell you what I did to achieve that very fine control that you saw in the third and good hand position. I'm sure you figured it out already. I put the tip of my hand down, and that is enormously important. The tip of your hand must be resting on something solid. And when I say the tip of your hand, in the case of most people, hand, this means the tip of the middle finger. This must be resting either right on the table, like so, or stacked up on one of its neighbors, or even two of its neighbors. But there must be something solid directly below that middle finger in order for you to have fine control. Now, you may say, that's all very well in the workshop and on the workbench. What about the operating situation where you don't have a good solid support? Well, we'll come to that later, and I'll show you what a good operating hand position is. It's a modification of this, which we'll come to in due course. Right now, let's concentrate on this basic workbench position and consider some further details of it. If you'll just take that instrument in your hand and look at it at the same time that you're looking at this, I can tell you something, some useful details about a good instrument holding position. Quite apart from the fact that you've got it resting firmly on the table, there are some other important things. Firstly, these two fingers, the two ulnar fingers, they don't have very much to do with the instrument holding. The only thing you need to think about with them is just to curl them up a little and tuck them inside the palm of your hand. Don't have them out like that. That isn't a useful hand position. If you just curl them up like this, they'll stay out of the way. Now let's think about those three important fingers, the thumb, the index, and the middle. As you'll notice, they're neither hyperextended, which is uncomfortable, nor are they hyperflexed, which is also uncomfortable. Y you may have heard that you ought to hold a micro instrument as though you were holding a pen. Well, a lot of people hold a pen like that. Don't do that. Just have them comfortably semi-flexed, like so. You need about an inch of the instrument projecting beyond the tip of your fingers. If you have too much, then you can't rest the tip of your fingers on the table. If you have too little, then you can't get to work at all. So about an inch is correct. And for most people with normal-sized hands, these 13-centimeter instruments are a much better length than the rather tiny instruments which used to be standard in microsurgery. They're better because you can rest them against the MP joint of your index, which is a good place to rest something. If you have something which can't be rested against that joint, you just don't have so much control over it. Now, another important point which you can't see so well from this angle, but which we'll see better from straight in front of the hand, is how these three fingers come together. These three fingers, if you look at them closely, the three essential fingers of the famous chuck grip, are touching one another. And that's a very important point. They're not set apart from one another. They're gently touched together. And the instrument just looks out from a little hole in the end there. The fingers are touching all the time. Now that's important because if you ignore this simple point and let your thumb float free here, free of the other fingers, you'll find that this happens. The side of the instrument which is controlled by the thumb will constantly be subject to this little tremor. I'm exaggerating it deliberately here, of course. It's a little tremor which comes from the thumb itself. That thumb tremor can be completely damped out if you simply touch the thumb against its neighbors. You'll then find that you can open and close the instrument 
with very perfect control and with much greater peace of mind than if you have the thumb standing out in the breeze like so. And now I'm going to talk about adjusting the microscope and I'm going to talk about instruments. This is a rather ornate teaching microscope. Disregard some of its complexity, if you will. There are some very simple things that you must know about and which you must attend to every time you sit down to work with a microscope. Nobody else is going to take care of these simple things for you. You, the surgeon, have it as a duty to take a look at that scope when you come in the room, check it over, and make sure that it's going to work for you today. Do this, again, as part of your surgical technique, as part of the job that you do. You check over electrical, mechanical, and optical factors. All very simple. Electrically, you turn on the light and you make sure it's good and bright. If it's partly bright and partly dark, that often means your bulb is about to fail. You might as well know about that ahead of time and put in a new bulb rather than have it fail right in the middle of the procedure. You turn on whatever switch is needed to turn on the remote control functions of your microscope and you check out the foot pedal if your microscope has one and see that when you want the microscope to go up or down, it does so. When you want the microscope to change magnifications, it does so. If anything's wrong or even slightly wrong with those electrical systems, you better get it checked out and corrected before you start. Mechanically, it's important that you be able to bring the microscope to where you will be working with the minimum of upheaval and fuss. Now, in the lab, this isn't a factor. Your microscope is set up right by the table. But in the OR, it can require a surprising amount of upheaval to bring the microscope to the patient unless you think about that ahead of time. Think how you're going to bring the microscope from where it is now to where it's got to be. Think just where it's going to stand next to the table and make sure that the microscope you're going to use has a long enough arm from here to here that you can readily bring it into action without discomfort, without uncomfortable proximity between you, the table, and the microscope stand. Still talking about mechanical factors, make sure that these movements of the suspension arm of the microscope are just semi-tight so that when you want to move the microscope around, you can move it around, and when you want it to stay still, it'll stay still without drifting. It's a mistake to have these loose, but it's a real mistake to have them done up too tightly. If they're too tight, you have a fight on your hands every time you want to adjust the scope. Mechanical factors continued on out to the business end of the microscope bring us to these two tilting adjustments. The tilting adjustment, both up and down and sideways, is frequently used to give us a combination of a good access uh, of view and also good comfort of body position and it's the one adjustment which you sometimes have to wait till you're in the middle of the operation before you finally set it. Once it's set that does need to be screwed up rather tightly otherwise your microscope's liable to capsize. Now, so much for mechanical factors let's finally get to some quite important optical factors, very simple ones. Your lenses need to be clean and the top end adjustments need to be correctly made. Once you've attended to all those things, your microscope's ready to use. Now this objective lens gets dirty very readily. Blood will sometimes get onto it, but more frequently Ringer's solution or saline irrigation solution will get onto it and it'll dry off and form a little frosting which will really impair your view. So you check that out. Don't assume that anyone else has checked it out before you because they won't have. You can clean that with a plain piece of cloth, not too fluffy, and at the same time clean your eyepieces. Make sure no dust has got in there. That brings us to the adjustment of the top end of the microscope. And I think just so that I can show this to you readily, I'll take the top off the microscope although it certainly isn't necessary to dismantle the microscope in order to make these adjustments. 
the top end of the microscope has two adjustments which have to be made personally for you. The first is the interpupillary distance and the second is the individual eyepiece focusing adjustment. The interpupillary distance has to be set correctly to the nearest millimeter if you're going to be able to see in three dimensions and if you do not have it correctly set and if you don't have a stereoscopic view you'll find the work is almost impossible. Now if you haven't looked down one of these before let me give you a word of advice. Don't try and set the interpupillary distance with your eyes right up against the microscope. Set that interpupillary distance after just backing off by an inch. Just back off by this much and then either push them together, pull them apart, keep on adjusting them till you see equally with both eyes. If you have your eyes too close up here, you'll see two great big circles and it won't be too easy for you to tell when you've just got them coinciding exactly. But if you back off by one inch, instead of looking at two great big circles down those eyepieces, you'll be looking at two little bitty spots of light and it's very easy to bring them just exactly together then you've got your interpupillary distance correct. A lot of microscopes have a little millimeter scale set right here. If you know what your interpupillary distance is, that's fine. Just set it right there. Last but not least, and most confusing to many, let's cover this adjustment here, the individual eyepiece focusing adjustment. This must be set correctly for you, for your eyesight, before you sit down to work. This isn't the adjustment by which the whole microscope is brought into focus. This is the adjustment by which you bring yourself into agreement with the microscope. If you have normal eyesight, all you need to know is that this adjustment should be set right on zero. And it'll be correct for you. Zero on one eyepiece, zero on the other eyepiece. And you're all set to go. If you're nearsighted, then you must set it to minus one or two or three, depending on how many diopters of eyepiece correction you have. If you know your prescription is minus 1.5 diopters, you set it right like that, to minus 1.5. If you're farsighted, you set it to plus one, plus two, plus three, and so forth. Now, why is this important? It's important because if you don't have it correctly set, you'll find that the microscope will go out of focus every time you change magnification. When you go from high to low, from low to high, your view will become blurred and you'll have all the trouble of refocusing the microscope before you can proceed. And when that happens 50 times in the course of a procedure, it gets mighty tiring. If you have this correctly set, you can remain in focus regardless of any magnification change. Finally, let's talk about instruments. When it comes right down to it, the work you do is done by your instruments. And the better your instruments are, the better your work is going to be. Unfortunately, we still have with us that bygone belief, which belongs to the Puritan work ethic, that there is something intrinsically noble about trying to do a good job with bad instruments. Uh, this belief absolutely does not apply to microsurgery, whether in the OR or in the lab. If you're not using the best instruments that are available, you're not doing the job right. And you should regard it as a fundamental fault of technique to even contemplate using bad instruments to do a job where the margin for error is so tiny. And certainly in the lab, you should use good, new, well cared for instruments. Don't use instruments that have been thrown out of the OR. Use instruments that are even better than the instruments in the OR. If somebody's in the OR and says, oh, this is bent, uh, send it to the lab. The only good teaching value that uh, can be made of that instrument is to put it in the hands of an expert and get him to demonstrate how good work can be done with it. But apart from that, the only thing to do with a bent instrument is to dismember it limb from limb and make sure that it never gets back into the hands of a surgeon, and particularly not in the lab. I think the, the 
concept that uh, second-rate equipment is good enough for the lab is an absolute insult both to the lab in general and to, to our surgical trainees. Now here in this lab, if you even think there's something even slightly wrong with one of your instruments, if you even think there might be, we expect you to comment on it. You may comment rudely on it. We hope you will. I would hate for any of you to waste any of your time working with an instrument that's even a little bit bent or a little bit out of whack, because we do aim to have the best possible instruments here for you to use. Let's just briefly look at the instruments that are here. These are what I would regard as sufficient for basic microsurgical practice. We have a pair of angulated jeweler's forceps, which are very useful as a light needle holder. We have a straight jeweler's forceps. We have a vessel dilator, which is a spe special purpose instrument that we'll come to later in this series of tapes. We have two pairs of scissors, a curved round pointed dissecting scissors and a straight sharp pointed adventitious scissors. We have a little clamp applicator forceps which goes with this double clamp of which we'll see plenty more at a later stage. And for our initial access and exposure we have a scalpel, a pair of toothed ophthalmic forceps and a pair of ring handled scissors. Lastly but not least a little piece of blue plastic background material completes our instrument set. These instruments live on a foam rubber pad and unless they're in your hand they should be back on that pad. When it comes time to clean them they should be picked up one at a time and put in the cleaning bath. We'll talk about instrument cleaning in just a little while. I'd like to turn to the other camera. I'd like to say a few general words about instruments, not in the lab, but in general. If you're going to do any amount of microsurgical work, it becomes essential for you to have your own instrument set. It needn't be a very grand instrument set. They needn't be very expensive, but they must be yours, and they must be only yours, and they must be well cared for. And here are a few general thoughts on that. Before you get any instruments, you need to get a case to put them in. A case such as this one, which has a lid, it's ventilated, and which has inside it a rack with a space for each instrument. The instruments can stay safely in that rack, and in that rack they do indeed live. They live in that rack when they're in storage, they live in that rack when they're being autoclaved, they stay in that rack when they're brought to the operation and they're put on a mayo stand beside you, and they only come out of that rack when you're good and ready to use them. As soon as you've finished using them, they go back in there, whether clean or dirty, and they stay in it till it's time to clean them. Now, if you make that an absolute rule, you'll hold on to your micro instruments and keep them in good shape for a remarkably long time because they don't get damaged while they're in your hand. They get damaged when they're on the way to the operation and when they're on their way from the operation and especially get, they get damaged at cleaning time. Micro instruments should never be mixed up with any other instruments at any time, especially not at cleaning time. If you, if you hear somebody pick up a handful of micro instruments and throw them in a sink along with all the other hardware, you can kiss those instruments goodbye right there. Because you see, to, to mortally damage a pair of jeweler's forceps, it's only necessary to drop them on a hard surface from the height of about an inch. If I did that on a hard surface with the tip of this jeweler's forceps, I would deform the tip by at least a thousandth of an inch, which is uh, a large deformity. It is a large deformity because these forceps have to handle 10 -o nylon, and 10 -o nylon is a thousandth of an inch in diameter. You bang up your instruments by a thousandth of an inch, you may as well throw them away. Now this begins to sound awfully threatening. How in the world can you protect your instruments from such even minor abuse? Firstly, as I say, by keeping them in a tray. Secondly, by making it a rule to everyone who handles them that their tips will never touch another hard metal object. Never, never any other hard metal object. This includes the tips of other instruments. 
So that dictates to you some simple rules, such as the fact that you will always pick them up one at a time and put them where they've got to be. You won't ever pick them up in a handful and throw them anywhere. When it comes time to clean the instruments, take them one at a time and put them in a bath of hemolytic enzyme detergent and leave them there for 10 minutes for all the blood to soften. Then take them out and rinse them in plain water and dry them even, either with a cloth or in the air and then put them back in their rack. And when they're good and dry, you can put the top back on that box and put them away for storage. Don't put them away wet because high quality instrument steel, although it's stainless, it's only fairly stainless. There are degrees of stainlessness and it will rust if you put them in a closed box, still moist. Another point, when it's time to autoclave the instruments, autoclave them and then use them. Don't do what's done in some ORs, autoclave them days ahead of time and then leave them wrapped in a towel on a shelf because likely there'll be some dampness trapped in there, either in the case or in the towel, and that'll make them rusty. Another point of detail which can become a major hazard is the matter of magnetization. All high quality instrument steel is magnetizable. There's no getting away from it. Magnetism arises partly from uh, being in contact with other magnetic, magnetic objects and partly from trauma of a direct nature. If you put your instruments down on a piece of electrical equipment that has a transformer or a motor in it, there's a danger they'll get magnetized. Sutures likewise. If you put your instrument or your sutures down on a metal shelf which has previously had something magnetic on it, they're liable to get magnetized. And the first thing you'll know about it is when you sit down and try to do a job of work and you find the needle is either running away from your instrument or uh, vigorously adhering to it. The cure for this, there's no absolute means of preventing it from happening in a normal OR, but the cure for it is to have a simple demagnetizing coil such as this one, place the instrument inside the coil, turn on the current, and slowly but slowly withdraw the instrument until it's two feet away, and then turn off the current. It's a very easy thing to do. It's a very easy thing to buy. And it's really a very small problem once you have the means of cure at hand. But that completes what I have to say about the basic preconditions of microsurgical work. What I suggest you do at this point is to sit down with your microscope, get comfortable in your place of work, and without any further instruction, take a piece of practice rubber and do a little suturing so that's what I suggest we do at this point.